Hi, my name is Caesar, and this is my friend CJ. And this is how we make Google Slide presentations. Was that not specific enough? Alright, let me explain. Simple as this, since CJ can't talk and I can't go inside the computer like he can, these presentations require teamwork, which means CJ presents the slide while I voice the slide. And that's how we create CJ Slides. Hey, you're just in time! I'm currently in the process of making my gaming lair. Come check it. So, how's it so far? Well, it's decent. Anyways, the Xbox Series and PS5 are finally out. So in today's episode, we will be talking about the start of the home console wars. We will rise from the start of the console wars to the present of 2021. And just to keep things quick, I will not include the handheld consoles. So grab your Warthog, Blade of Chaos, and your Fire Flower, and let's -a go! Hey, that's my Warthog! I'm pretty much learning about these console wars as well. I don't even know what half of these consoles are. But anyways, we will begin with the second generation. The second generation of video game consoles have their very first console war. The Atari versus the Fairchild versus the Bali! It all began with the release of the Fairchild F in 1976. Then came the release of the Atari VCS, later known as the Atari 2600. The Atari computer system was introduced in 1977 at the price point of $199. That same year, the Bali Astrocade was also released with the arcade hit Gunfight as a built-in game. Now, none of the consoles were exactly major sellers. The VCS had a strong lead, but the war came to an abrupt as a result of the video game crash of 1977. The Fairchild and Bali were forced to exit the home console market within the next one or two years, which made the Atari the only major survivor from this battle. But despite that, they also struggled as VCS sales slowed down. What the? Oh, oh my god. Wait, hold up! The pipe is still on! The pipe is still on! Everything is getting sucked into the pipe! No! No! Ah! Once the quote-unquote golden age of arcade video games began in 1978 with the mainstream success of Tato's arcade game, Space Invader Game, Atari soon released a home console for the VCS. As a result, they successfully revived. Whoa! Uh, revive from the dead! Whoa! Atari even expanded the home console market, and the console war resumed and escalated to a full-scale war. New competitors began to enter the market. And speaking of markets, let's see if I can find any of these games in, at this flea market. Huh? Sands? Ooh! Atari games? Um, no thanks. Yeah, I'm not that hungry. <gasps> um, one please. Around 1980, sales were super high, and 3 million homes owned Atari consoles. In 1978, several new competing consoles appeared. The Manvox Odyssey, Intellivision, and ColecoVision, each managing to gain a market share. Although the Atari 2600 would remain the most dominant console of that era, Atari soon renamed themselves the Atari 5200 in 1992 when the Atari introduced the next generation. Seeing the success of Atari, 
toy company Mattel began working on its own console in 1978, the Intellivision, which was released in 1980 at the price of $299. And the system was an immediate success! Mattel was not the only system to challenge Atari, but it was the first to pose a serious threat to Atari's dominance. Intellivision took the further step by airing TV ads featuring women in bikinis. This was an attack to the Atari's VCS lesser capabilities with a side-by-side -side comparison. Nevertheless, Atari held exclusive rights to the popular arcade game conversions to this day, and used this key segment to support its older hardware in the market. A new foe appears. The ColaVision was introduced by Coleco in 1982 and sold 500,000 units during its first year. It was priced similarly to the Intellivision and had a decisive technological edge over its rivals, being known as the true first 8-bit console ever, meaning it can duplicate coin-operated arcade games. Coleco even licensed several major arcade games for its system, including Nintendo's Donkey Kong. This was the end of the first console war, ending with the North American video game industry crash of 1983. It had huge supplies over poor quality video games, and it had some competitions with personal computers, caused game prices to drop precisely. This led Atari to suffering major losses and nearly all of its competitors abandoning the market. The first console war was led by American manufacturers. Most of the subsequent console wars would be led almost entirely by Japanese manufacturers. Up until the 21st century, this is when American manufacturer Microsoft began gaining a share of the console market. <coughs> These wars are grouped under one category here. But there were many different minor wars between home computer brands running from the mid-80s until the mid-90s. These wars mainly took place in the United Kingdom and Japan, which during the 80s were the centers of the world computer game industry. Having been unaffected by the crash that took place in the US, this period also re-owned for being the time of the bedroom programmer, and many companies formed by such people have lasted until that current day. There are British computer wars and Japanese computer wars, but I'd rather not get to those and keep this episode as short as possible, so we'll just skip those. Now we get to what is known as the 8-bit era, when the first time a console war extended across the world with Nintendo and Sega battling for dominance in many territories. The 8-bit era began on July 15th, 1973 with the Japanese release of two consoles, the Family Computer and the SG-1000. But since the Family Computer was more of an advanced console at the time, the Family Computer outperformed the SG-1000. Nintendo then released the Family Computer in North Korea, which we know as the Nintendo Entertainment System, aka the NES, in 1985. The NES revived the console gaming industry in North America. Japan, however, came to dominate the worldwide game console market for many generations. By the time, the more advanced console known as the Master System was released in 1995 in Japan and 1986 in North America. But it was too late. Nintendo Entertainment System already came out on the top of the NTSC regions of North America and Japan. However, where it was known as the Nintendo Famicom partially due to its earlier release, but this was mostly because Nintendo banned many developers from releasing NES games on other systems. Nintendo's third-party licensing restrictions, quote-unquote, put a damper on a third-party support of the Master System, making the rest of Nintendo's competition in North America and Japan. The Atari 7800 also had some limited success in the United States. They were battling with Sega for second place in the American market, since both trailing behind from Nintendo. Beyond American market, Atari was nowhere near as successful as Sega and Nintendo in any other markets. The 16-bit era. 
is mostly known as the Western markets for rivalry between the Sega Mega Drive. The 16-bit era is mostly known as the Western market for the rivalry between the Sega Mega Drive, or known as the Sega Genesis in North America, and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, or often abbreviated to the SNES or Super NES, no, or known as the Super Famicom in Japan. The Sega Genesis came out about two and a half years later than the SNES. However, it did not perform well at retail until Sega released Sonic the Hedgehog, which drove sales. Oh! Overall, SNES emerged as the leader in the Western markets, closely followed by the Genesis, and then the TurboGrafx-16 uh, slash PC Engine in a distant third place. In the Eastern markets, the SNES emerged the leader, followed by the PC Engine as a runner-up, then the Mega Drive in third place. Nintendo was so successful. It was brought to that point where Sony teamed up with them in 1991. Both Nintendo and Sony worked together and created a console that was never released. It was called the Super Nintendo Entertainment System CD-ROM, or as many fans refer to it as the Nintendo PlayStation. It's a Super Nintendo with a built-in CD drive. Unfortunately, Nintendo failed their part of the deal with Sony, which ended up with Nintendo stabbing Sony in the back by working with one of Sony's rivals and refusing to make games for the SNES CD-ROM console they made together. Therefore, the Sony PlayStation was born. In the 32-bit era, the Sega Saturn was released first. But despite the success in Japan markets, suffocant third-party support outside of Japan for it to survive, Sega decided to release their console four months early before the PS1 and N64 in the US. You think that'd be a good idea? Well, that bit Sega on the butt. The head start failed for several reasons. For one, you must release the console on time, not early. What the? Early Kyler, get out of here! Cartoon Network nor Adult Swim allowed me to let you on this episode. Ugh, freaking Squidbilly. Anyways, you can't release a console early because you need to take the time to test and redesign it. One of the major reasons for Sega being early birds was because there were a few software titles ready. In the US, the Sega Saturn also released $100 more expensive than the PlayStation at its launch. Sony took an early advantage by initiating an expensive ad campaign. Sony mainly appeared to an older demographic that had adults playing video games. Sega, and particularly Nintendo, offering spread of games were characterized as appealing more to children. Both companies, for instance, featured mascots. For Nintendo, Super Mario. As for Sega, Sonic the Hedgehog. The mascots would even appear in cartoons. With Sony's greater hardware sales growing, the PlayStation won the era. The era virtually unposed. Sony carried this momentum over into the release of the PlayStation 2. Sadly for Sega, the Saturn was discontinued in 1998. Sega tried once more to gain a head start over Sony with their next console, the Sega Dreamcast. Despite its failure, the Saturn was surprisingly a success in Japan where it outsold the Nintendo 64. It was considered the most successful Sega console in the country. As a result, the Saturn continued selling in Japan several years longer than the other regions. This era was known as the 32-bit era, but Nintendo skipped ahead to the 64-bit era. The Nintendo 64 was released later than the other two consoles. By the time of its release date, Sony already had dominance over the other consoles, especially because the Saturn struggled to survive. Nintendo's use of cartridge media rather than the compact disc was due to the space limits and its high cost involved. The Nintendo 64 had much faster loading times because of its cartridge media and they managed to carve a profitable Nike in this era, selling over 30 million consoles! As the consoles began to feature a built-in modern, the Sega Dreamcast offered players a new gaming experience. Users were able to play games from one another with the internet, 
aka the start of online gaming. The Dreamcast was now known as the Soul Sticks generation console for over a year. That is, until Sony released the PlayStation 2. What? What the? What's going on? Oh, what the heck? Ah! No! I'm falling into the PlayStation void! Despite the Dreamcast being a complete failure in Japan, it became successful in North America, but due to the PS2's built-in DVD player and heavy advertising, the Dreamcast became overshadowed by the PlayStation 2's hype. But despite this, the Dreamcast managed to outsell the PlayStation 2 in the North American market in the year 2000. But this wasn't enough to make up for the losses in both hardware and software sales, which most of them were pirated. What the- Kratos! No! Ah! In the year 2001, Sega announced that the Dreamcast has been discontinued. They decided to abandon the console industry and focus on third-party development. Therefore, the Dreamcast left the market as the sixth generation competition begins to increase. Nevertheless, Sega had continued to manufacture arcade machines through to the present day. Making their consoles may have not been their best move, but they managed to survive making games for other platforms. On March 4th, to on March 4, 2000, Sony released the PlayStation 2 in Japan. Unlike previous consoles, the PlayStation 2 could play DVDs, creating an additional value for consumers interested in purchasing both a DVD player and a gaming console. Within two days of the PlayStation 2's release, Sony set a new world record. What would that be? Selling one million consoles! The initial supply didn't meet the demand, however. There was a shortage even among those who pre-ordered which led to inflated reselling and reported thefts. Although the PlayStation 2 did not originally focus on inactivity, Sony developed an external adapter that enabled online gaming for select titles, but only after the Xbox's release. So how did Microsoft join the competition with the Xbox? Well, here's the interesting thing that was all over the internet for a while. The original plan was Microsoft wanting to buy Nintendo, along with EA, Square, and Midway. They all denied. But what happened when Microsoft made the deal with Nintendo? Let's talk about it. In an attempt to create exclusives for the original Xbox, Microsoft wanted to buy these companies. They brought Nintendo to their building and showed them technical specs of the Xbox. From Microsoft's perspective, they believed Nintendo's hardware stunk compared to the Sony PlayStation. In Microsoft's words, listen, you're much better at the game hardware portions of it, with Mario and all that stuff. Why don't you let us take care of the hardware? Not only Nintendo denied, according to Microsoft, they quote-unquote laughed their asses off. EA just gave a simple no thanks, but Nintendo? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> The staff of Nintendo laughed for a good while, but as funny as this sounds, it's humiliating. If you worked at Microsoft at the time, I guarantee you wouldn't be laughing. Alright guys, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the episode right here. Until next week, when part 2 comes out, we will continue off with the Xbox versus the GameCube versus the PlayStation. So see you guys in the next episode. This is CJ, signing off.